Hi everyone, welcome to um, the first lecture in your ISC history syllabus concerning the Indian history, the national, the freedom struggle. So the first lesson we are going to begin and talk about a few important aspects in the later struggle for freedom. So basically we are going to talk about the period of uh, 30s, 40s and 50s. Okay. I'm not 50s, 30s and 40s basically. We'll be discussing about this entire period, what happened during this period, how did the freedom struggle and the freedom movement gain impetus. Because in the past we have seen a lot of incidents have happened in India. Um, there was a constant, uh, you know, fight for, um, you know, the freedom, the independence of the country. A lot of sessions of Congress had been held. Uh, 1885 Congress itself was formed for all of you who don't no. Okay. A lot of struggles for Congress had been held already. So, uh, I, mean, I mean, struggles for independence have been held already. We saw the partition of Bengal. We saw that both the sides, be it English or uh, be it the Indians, they were fighting heart and soul. Okay. Whereas one side was fighting to colonize, to take, um, you know, take us totally in their dominion. The other was fighting for their independence. So, while um, the British tried to partition Bengal, divide us on the basis of uh, religion, the Indians were trying hard to not let British do this. So, as a retaliation to the partition of Bengal, we came up with the Swadeshi and boycott movement. This event has happened. We saw Rowlett Act. We saw Jallianwala Bagh incident. A lot of things had happened before, you know, 1935. But today's focus is not going to be those lot of things. Today's focus is going to be what happened 1935 onwards. Year 1935 to 1947 is what is going to be primarily our focus. Okay, so we'll discuss about um, 1935. Of course, if I say 1935, it should ring a bell. Okay, um, the Government of India Act had come. 35 should ring a bell, 47 of course should gain independence, Be between them we saw civil disobedience, Chauri Chaura, quit India, a lot of movements had been you know initiated at this particular point. But you know this, this entire phase also saw a lot of activities from each side, not just from one but from each side we had a lot of activities you know commencing. Now what do I mean by each side? Talk about the year 1935 and you already know that you have two parties being formed on the basis of religion. One is, of course, the, I mean, Congress was not formed on the basis of religion, but uh, a few members of Congress separated themselves from Congress when this idea of religious discrimination stepped in. So the British had already sown the seeds, and now the seed had started, you know, up, um, you know, what do we say, germinating, okay? plant had you know roots had developed plants were forming now and that's what led to the formation of muslim league under the leadership of muhammad ali jinnah okay so we had the formation of muslim league under muhammad ali jinnah now all of these events and uh, the government of india act and many more things combined they eventually led to a lot of clashes between the muslim league and congress and when 1947 came, we did not have any other option than to, you know, work on the two nation theory. Although we had a lot of, uh, you know, leaders within the Congress itself who were not agreeing with the idea of two nation theory. But when you move towards, you know, when you see the events that are lined up and when you move towards the year 1947, you understand that there was no other option for the country other than to be divided because a lot of communalism had been, you know, generated and it had now, you know, what do we say, um, spread in the society, that people had started thinking that India or Hindustan is for Hindus and that's why we need a Pakistan, a pure nation which is for Muslims, purely for Muslims. Okay, so though now we say that Hindustan is not just for Hindus. Today we say that India is a secular country. Okay, and Pakistan claims it's a religious state. Okay, so Pakistan sustains on its theory, but we too sustain on our theory. We were never, um, you know, a state of Hindus, a country of Hindus. We accommodated everybody. 
we welcomed with open hands any religion that came in india be it islam then be it christianity we have accepted we have embraced all of them okay but nonetheless um so situation of 1947 is pretty well known to all of you um what happened 1940s after 1947 during 1947 is a part of the next lecture we all know that you know the partition was not a very smooth process the partition was a sudden process the british were too smart uh, you know to come up with the mount batten plan suddenly give us the independence and you know leave everything hey why so because of all of these things india was left in a chaos but that is something we are going to discuss in the next lesson what's supposed to be discussed right now is what happened between the years 1935 to 47 now uh, when i talk about 1935 to 47 another important thing that you need to keep in mind is the world scenario in the world you are seeing that you know um i would request that as and when i am going ahead with the slides something that you keep in mind especially when years pop in that you understand what is happening in the world at the very same time so uh, that is why i have taken the cold war lecture already so that you know it it ingrained in your mind already i mean i would suggest go for cold war and then go for um this indian thing so you can understand the indian situation keeping in mind the cold war situation because we were not so not cold war my bad world war okay so keeping in mind uh, the situation of world war 2 you can understand the indian situation all right so yeah suggestion read uh, world war 2 first and then go for um, this thing independence thing so we all know 1939 to 45 um, the cold war events were at their peak even before that um germany and italy and japan they were going on and on with you know their accessions and all those things their expansions and uh, we saw that france and britain they are following a policy of appeasement america is not directly involved in the war so a lot of things were happening over there and they were leaving some more impact on india itself so now when we study this chapter we will also refer to certain instances of cold war and how did they actually uh, i mean world war why am i saying cold war world war so world war 2 a lot of events had happened you could say that that could be one of the reasons or rather that was one of the reason why british had to withdraw from you know india among other colonies because they knew that they had lost a lot fighting a war there so it isn't logical enough to you know fight wars over here also because the national movement the freedom struggle had already gained impetus over here in india also at the very same time so it wasn't a very you know feasible option for british to just jump in and fight everywhere when there was a bigger war going on in europe okay um our indian nationalists also saw that as an opportunity for them to you know catalyze their struggle and um, of course one of the most prominent uh, you know hands in this entire process was mr subhash chandra bose but uh, about bose we'll talk a little later i mean in the series of lecture just a little later okay um talk about 1935 a very prominent ideology was developing and that ideology was of socialism so among the prevailing ideology of nationalism nationalism was a prevalent ideology the feeling of nationalism was among every citizen now the love for their country it was among every citizen now this feeling of nationalism was prevalent and at the same time we saw the development of socialism also among people now socialism was close now go back once again i'm saying go back to the world war event socialism is very closely associated with communism and against capitalism so the prominent people who were supporting socialism like the one you are going to study about m n roy they delved you know closer they moved closer to the russian communism all right 
this was the prevailing situation now we begin with your lesson with your chapter and we try to understand how the situation went on how socialism was there in congress and then it was taken out from congress and you know how eventually people discovered that we need a form of socialism which mrs gandhi later on even vocalized um she you know what do we say she didn't actually i mean that was going on in india but adding words to it giving the term was done by mrs gandhi later okay so um and by the way especially all those who are in cms Mrs. Gandhi, I don't mean Mrs. Bharti Gandhi, I mean Mrs. Indira Gandhi. In case, because there are people who are actually very smart and then come up with questions, which Mrs. Gandhi? So just clarification sake, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, who verbalized, vocalized this later on, gave it a phase, gave it a term, that we are practicing a mix of Marxism and Gandhism. we are practicing fabian socialism but that was later okay uh, right now we see that incorporating socialism in the congress and the socialist idea was not very easy for the original congress members and that is what we are going to look at but before that let's talk about emin roy emin roy born as narendra nath bhattacharya 21st march 1887 in bengal presidency which is presently in bangladesh so i mean roy was born in a bengal presidency right now a part of bangladesh initially he was involved in the anti colonial struggle against the british rule in india he participated in revolutionary activities against the british government and you would see that he was deeply inspired by the writings of bankim chandra chatterjee chatopadhyay chatterjee okay and swami vivekanand as well swami vivekanand uh, was an inspiration for most of us especially his chicago speech where he addressed the the united states of american the citizens of united states of america as my brothers and sisters Okay, so that's a prominent speech, and of course, he was inspired by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. That is M. N. Roy. Now, um, what happened is that uh, Indian struggle. If you see, uh, the Indian freedom struggle was not very supportive of the idea of communism or the idea of um, what do we say, socialism per se. we weren't very supportive of these ideas okay um and because he was so much inspired by the you know ideologies of uh, these two people bankim chandra chatterjee swami vivekanand he thought in a different way so while he was indulging in all these things came year 1905 the partition of bengal at that same time you saw a lot of movements had started including this swadeshi and boycott movement people were moving for you know annulment of the partition at that very same time emin roy was expelled from the school because he was participating in a march against the partition so the school was a british school em emin roy was participating in the struggle against partition so he was technically expelled from the school then he went to calcutta and he joined what we call the anushilan samiti i don't know if i've written it here or not let me see ah uh, okay it's not here anyway so he later on joined the anushilan samiti uh, after he was expelled from his school and he was an active worker there later on he was released and you know um he still kept on fighting but after that he realized that i can't keep on doing these things i need to do something constructive okay you can't just make bombs throw bombs at the british parliament and then you know you can just enjoy the time he, his his aim was to do something you know um constructive at that time not just throwing bombs okay so um um you know um emin roy he became convinced at that same time that although i am not just going to be involved in this um, normal activities but the only way to remove british from india is an armed struggle he was totally convinced about that 
okay so for that he along with the revolutionary nationalists they looked towards germany for funds and armaments okay the plan here was to use help from germany okay um they also wanted to free andaman islands um all the prisoners taken in andaman i hope uh, i'll show you a picture also towards the end how the kalapani's uh, jail looks like but andaman islands prisoners were taken okay so they looked for help towards germany to release these prisoners then they would arm the prisoners provide arms and ammunition to the prisoners so that they could also be involved in a fight against um this thing um the british okay after see germany what happened in germany was already something um which is why i once again say please keep in mind the world war 2 situation germany was fighting its own wars its troops were here and there germany did not want to help indians even it wants to throw overthrow british now try to understand the logic over here as an opponent you would want to um, you know help your opponent's opponent but germany did not do it there could be many reasons one of the reasons could be he did not i mean hitler did not find any benefit for him over here so had hitler been involved in the indian struggle okay or helping the indians giving them arms and ammunition then first of all it would have been declared one more primary spot of world war india itself okay another thing is that he would have got no benefit capturing india was a far away thing and he wanted to go slow it wasn't a very huge advantage for hitler to capture india china was there on top okay do japan was close enough but then you know it wasn't a very good idea to do that and uh, also uh, if you look at this that you know there were a lot of middle east nations in between which he had to capture before he could go to india okay so india was giving him no advantage and hitler was of course fighting for advantage fighting for you know expanding giving a living space lebensraum to the germans so it wasn't very you know fruitful for him to you know invest in india so he did not when hitler refused to invest in india or help out the indians it was the chinese that emin roy moved towards it was the chinese that emin roy moved towards okay um so he uh, he went to um actually um first he went to japan okay for japanese support but that's the place he met the J chinese leader so you are saying okay uh because he was there in uh, japan chinese leader sunyatsi was there in japan he took shelter in japan so he stayed over there okay and um, even sunyatsi he refused to help emin roy against the british okay that is when emin roy moved to san francisco and there he developed his interest in marxism this happened in san francisco okay so in san francisco he developed his interest in marxism and developing interest in marxism now you are seeing that a socialist ideology is very closely relating to the communist ideology okay in san francisco itself he found the communist party of mexico okay uh, it was the first communist party that was formed outside russia after the formation of this particular party he was invited to russia and he became one of the founding members of the communist party of india in the year 1920 okay there he was in russia he was at the request of lenin and he prepared the uh, east and uh, sorry yeah the east uh, the paper which was called the uh, okay i'm forgetting the name of the paper uh uh okay i'm i'm there was a paper for east i am not getting the name of the paper right now um anyway so he prepared a paper for east and lenin was really impressed by his ideologies and that's when lenin decided that okay um he's going to be one of the members of the communist party and he lenin deeply impressed by him uh, helped him and that's when communist party of india was formed
you would also see that the in russia itself in moscow itself the second congress of the communist international was held and mn roy was a part of that congress okay so in 1920 everything was going well for him for him okay um if you see if you move four years beyond this you will see that an indian communist party was also formed in the year 1924 okay then there was an all india conference of the communist held at kanpur okay and this all india conference held at kanpur was the initial formation of cpi the communist party of india okay but now what happened is fast forward five more years and you will see that mn roy and stalin had ideological differences and that is when he was expelled from comintern which was actually led by russia itself so mn roy was expelled from comintern though mn roy he keep kept on exploring his marxist ideology his principles he developed his own version of marxist humanism okay you come to india later on mn roy was also expelled from cpi because of once again the ideological differences now see what happens over here is the more you study the more you explore the more you relate things with your experience the more and more knowledgeable you become it's when you start thinking and when you start thinking and analyzing and critiquing each and every aspect that you're studying about maybe something different arises like for example i am teaching you right now something okay the next time i take the same lecture there might be some new point that comes into my mind and i might you know after that take the lecture that way okay uh there are times when you eventually black out while you're studying it happens with me a lot of times that you know i'm talking i'm teaching and i eventually go all you know black out what was i talking about and most of us are in a habit of zoning out also so these are all you know things of your mind a same thing of mind is you know experiencing new things even after repeating that one particular knowledge so each time he understood the marxist ideology more in depth he started relating those ideologies to his own experiences and that is when he discovered some new element into that and gave birth to marxist humanism a new form of his own version of marxism okay that is mn roy see at the same time in 1930 you will see he met jawaharlal nehru and subhash chandra bos um though you know after that he was arrested and put in jail for 5 years when he was released 1936 nehru invited him to you know uh, to allahabad to improve his broken health see the comintern had told him and roy to be against the national congress but uh, he defied the comintern order and he urged the indian communists to join the party okay um uh, he started his weekly independent india very important the name would be very important mn roy's weekly was independent india so he started independent india in the year 1937 it was his weekly okay and you know it was all welcomed by jawaharlal nehru subhash chandra bose okay see now there were a few section of leaders in the party itself who did not agree with his idea okay who thought that his communist ideas wouldn't go down well with the country in the long run one of them was gandhi ji himself okay so this um even the staunch communists deviate i mean um accused him of deviating from what he decided to do initially and over time even he became disillusioned with bourgeois democracy and communism so he broke off his connection with congress and he created a radical democratic party okay in 1943 year 1954 you will see that he passed away 1954 okay 1940 his party formed republican democratic party so these were a few instances in the life of mn roy a very important leader concerning the origin of two important ideologies one of them is socialism 
and the other one is communism okay because if you see this was brought which led to this so very prominent you know um uh, what do we say a prominent gift to the indian subcontinent Uh, I think I have talked about all of this. He founded the Renaissance, Indian Renaissance Institute in 1935, where he worked on synthesizing Marxist principles with a focus on individual freedom and humanism. Okay. He influenced the intellectual and political history of India, Marxist thought and his death. So I've talked about most of them. Okay. Coming to Jawaharlal Nehru. You talk about Jawaharlal Nehru. We discuss about him under various subheadings. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of Independent India, the leader of Congress for a lot of time, for a lot of its sessions. Jawaharlal Nehru, he was influenced by social ideals. And he believed that we need economic and social justice in post-independent India. Something you will study about Jawaharlal Nehru once again when you are moving ahead towards this thing. Um, the next chapter, okay, because that's the beginning. Um, that's the scene after 1947. We see that, um, you know, the ideology of organizing um, linguistic states. He totally goes against that ideology which enrages people. And, um, you know, we see such a huge moment, moment of Pati Sri Ramalu in uh, Telanga, in Andhra Pradesh. Okay, demanding a separate linguistic state of Andhra Pradesh, separating it from Madras. So all of this goes on. Okay, but initially, I mean, initially not. I mean, he was a you know a prop one such person who propagated the need for economic and social justice. What do we mean by economic justice? Poverty, hunger eliminated, social justice, equality, right? no discrimination, a lot of things. Nehru, he wanted a mixed economy. So he didn't want a purely socialist economy. He didn't want a, prop, a purely capitalist economy. He wanted a mixed economy. And that is what we are going on with today in India, a mixed economy. He advocated for a planned economy. And you will see that this planned economy, it was uh, you know, um, taken from the Russian five-year plans. Okay, with a strong role for the state in key sectors while allowing private enterprises in other areas. So this is what we mean by mixed economy, that we do allow private enterprises to jump in, but the strong role would be there of the state as well. In the important sectors, like, you know, important sectors, what? It could be defense. Defense is an important sector. It could be law and order. It could be communication. For all these sectors, it is very important that the state holds the primary primary support, and it is not the private player. So now, if you see, um, uh, for a few years now, for these past uh, 72, 73 years, DIA, I mean, ISRO was the only organization dealing in technology and you know space works and stuff. But now, defense and tech, and ISRO, HAL, I mean, all those. Um, government-owned things, but now private players are also entering into the scene. Okay, so that's happening slowly, but major power is held by state itself. We came up with five-year plan starting 1951, and that was not because he was a very, you know, he wanted to, uh, you know, borrow the ideology of Russia. His primary aim was that we know India is suffering from poverty, we are running in prime practically a negative GDP. So why not do one thing? Let's organize how we are going to do. Like when you guys are going to prepare for your exam and you know, okay, I haven't done anything. I have a lot because Nehru was starting from the scratch. So he had a lot to do in a span of the next 10 to 20 years. So he devised this idea of five year plan so that we could understand for the first five years, we are going to focus on this particular aspect. For the next five years, we're going to focus on this particular aspect and that's so on. So he came up with this idea of five year plan to implement a systematic development and economic planning, okay? Uh, these plans, they focused on, you will see initially they focused on agriculture, then industries came, okay? Development, poverty, alleviation, 
एलिविएशन मीन्स लेसनिंग नॉट एलिवेशन एलिविएशन ओके नेहरू फोकस ऑन द स्टैब्लिशमेंट ऑफ पब्लिक सेक्टर इंडस्ट्रीज would state playing a leading role in sectors like steel mining and heavy machinery so or the state had a primary role in all these industries steel mining heavy machinery okay and public sector was seen as a means to achieve self reliance and reduced economic disparities but then again you will see 1991 lpg entry of fdi no it was now public plus private so we saw that maybe for the benefit of the country in the long run we have to change a few ideologies okay it's see nehru was no more there but we as indians realized that this is very important okay now coming to nehru socialist ideology you move to the year 1930 and you will see that his ideologies they were felt within and outside the congress okay um jawala nehru he was influenced by socialist ideas see while he was there in switzerland uh he was there in switzerland for the treatment of um, his wife kamla nehru okay um there he came to know about the socialist ideas he came to know about soviet union and the bolshevik revolution okay 27 he visited soviet also the, he was invited and there he was greatly impressed with economic and social reconstructions okay um he expected to make the full use of the knowledge that he is gaining there in soviet okay again you know he'll see that oh, he came back in the year 1927 and utilized the knowledge that he gained okay um in soviet and you will see that these ideologies his work m n roy's contribution it quite influenced the other uh, young people also in the country okay 1929 1936 1937 and then you will see that subhash chandra bose was actually in, uh, elected in 1938 all of this showed the left wing tendency in the congress itself okay and um, jawalal nehru um in the karachi session of 1931 he said that if you want to end whatever is happening with people in the country their exploitation you have to come up with the idea of economic freedom because exploitation will be there as long as people are not free economically okay and how will economic freedom come increase the wages of people okay uh, tax pe those rich workers more okay state must control key industries okay so this is what he came up with he um, you know his idea of fundamental rights economic program all of this was adopted in karachi session okay and uh, you will see that his ideologies were special uh, you know a uh, moving fast spreading fast okay um lucknow session it was a landmark in the evolution of socialist ideas okay and you will see 1937 congress they also condemned the japanese aggression uh, again see world war is jumping in 1937 japanese accession of which place in china it was manchuria and Jap japan was moving ahead so jawaharlal nehru he totally you know reprimanded japan for doing what it was doing right now okay simultaneously you will see that nehru he supported land reforms to address the issues of agrarian and inequality okay his aim was to improve the conditions of rural people his aim was to increase the wages of workers his aim was to tax a special tax for the elite state control of vital sectors all this was included within nehru's ideologies okay he advocated for a um, a form of democratic socialism okay where he said that social justice and equal opportunities are very important okay 
So he combined the social economist principle with the democratic political structure. And all of us very beautifully know about his NAM. Okay. So it was also influenced by his ideas of socialism. Okay. He advocated for a solidarity with the newly independent nations. He wanted to avoid any alignment with any other nation. Okay. His socialist policies, along with M.N. Roy's, they left a lasting impact on people in India. And of course, his ideas of planned economic development, role of public sector, it continued for a lot of decades, okay, even after he passed away. That was Jawaharlal Nehru and his socialist ideology, okay. Um, he kept on urging National Congress. That they should accept socialism as its goal, okay, uh, bring itself closer to the working class population so that it could understand them. Coming to another prominent leader in the scene, Subhash Chandra Bose. Subhash Chandra Bose was born on January 23, Katak, Odisha. He came from a prominent Bengali family, studied in Presidency College, Calcutta, later at Cambridge. He became involved in Indian nationalist politics during his student years. Okay. He was there initially with Indian National Congress. He worked closely with leaders like Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, he was also elected the president, like I said a while ago, of Congress in 1938. But he and Mahatma Gandhi, you will see if you go in depth before these years and even at the same time, you will see that Mahatma Gandhi and him had you know, a clash of ideologies. So he diverged from Congress because Mahatma Gandhi was leading Congress at this time. I mean, not leading as in actually being the leader, but it was his views that were considered the prominent ones. Okay. So Bhashchandra Bose, guys, if you remember, go back a few years when Congress was formed, we talked about two sections of Congress being formed, moderates and extremists. This idea of moderates and extremists, it sustains throughout the struggle, throughout the freedom struggle. It isn't dropping off. Okay. You'll see that um, uh, every time, you know, um, every decade or every time the Congress sees a new leadership or any new membership, there are some members who are voting for a more aggressive policy which wasn't in line with what Mahatma Gandhi was doing. Because Mahatma Gandhi wasn't doing aggressive. He, his behavior was more submissive in nature. Now tell me one thing. You are able to collect people. Just think logically. You collect people, you organize a dandy march. Okay? People are there with you all throughout the journey. But then, what after that? People move, you organize a dandy march, people are, um, you know, okay, avoiding the salt tax. What after that? How long will you be able to do it? And for how many things will you be able to do it? British would come, charge you, put you inside prison, and they have a lot of prison. They'll build more. Then what? So I believe that, um, like, right, nowadays also you see, try to understand the situation. 2016, 2012, gang rape cases. The entire India went on candle march. What then? We saw, we saw this coming. We saw stricter rape laws coming. But isn't rape happening? Do you think the women around you feel safe can you allow your uh, sisters or you know your mothers or you if you yourself are a girl can you would you feel safe as the sun goes down after that after seven o'clock eight o'clock would you feel safe going around the streets doing whatever you want to 
I'm sure if there's an emergency at night, 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 12 p.m., 12 a.m., it's the male member of the house who leaves the house and, you know, goes for whatever, you know, solution of the emergency. But the women don't. So, trust me, you need a more, I won't say pick up arms, of course. Uh, you can't do that and you shouldn't do that. But go back to the uh, time before independence. I am not saying that picking up arms was the only thing, but they had to be more vocal, more aggressive in their actions, rather than just, you know, simply uh, organizing marches and ending it. Okay? So, and then, you know, um, a lot of marches are seen here and there, everywhere. They don't leave a lot of impact. So, I don't think there's a point, though, you know, the society understands the importance of them. But majority of the times you will see that whatever has happened, has happened. The truck workers, the drivers, all of them worked, went on a strike. Did the Bharatiya Nyaya Samhita change or something happened to that? No, laws can't be changed. You can't change everything just because you go on the road and you start fighting and oh, change it. You can't do it for everything. Okay, you have to work, you have to earn your livelihood. So you go back to these um, times when uh, people were fighting. Subhash Chandra Bose thought that just going on a march is not going to be fruitful for the Indian. We need our independence and that independence should be vocalized in front of them. They should be shown that we need independence and that's um, when he, you know, his ideology differed with Mahatma Gandhi. That's what led towards that rift in Congress over here. Okay. Um, he established the forward block in year 1939. Forward block was a faction within the Congress, but it opposed the British government during the World War II time. So instead of sending the British soldiers, the Mahatma Gandhi said, we'll send the soldiers. We'll send Indians to fight for you in World War II. But Subhash Chandra Bose said, no, why should I send soldiers to fight for you? So he refused. Okay, that was the situation during World War II. Subhash Chandra Bose, he evaded house arrest, house arrest by the British, and he saw international support for India's independence. He traveled to Germany and later to Japanese-occupied Southeast Asia. He formed the INA over there with the support of the Axis powers. Um, he led the INA. INA was actually a combination of, it, it comprised of Indian prisoners, okay, prisoners of war, and it had few civilians also. They came together in battles against the British in Burma and Northeast India. And you all know Subhash Chandra Bose's war cry, give me blood and I shall give you freedom. The circumstances of Subhash Chandra Bose till date are controversial. We don't know he, how he died. According to the official, I'm quoting it, according to the official report, he died in a plane crash in Taiwan on August 18, 1945. But till date, he's one such leader who's appreciated by a lot of people, a charismatic leader, a daring leader who sought to liberate India through military means. His contributions to the Indian independence movement and the formation of INA, they have less let, you know, they have let a lasting impact on India's history. He was somebody who offered a different ideology to the Indian leaders then also. We were moving with one ideology, an ideology of being submissive, an ideology of being subtle in our actions. But he didn't say be subtle. Neither did he say, okay, chalo, start bombing. He said, our rulers have fought wars before us. Let's fight a legit war. Okay? And that's what he was organizing the army for. That we, as Indians, as Indians have a legacy behind us. And we have learned that, yes, we will fight a war head on. We are not going to be subtle with you. Let's do it directly. Let's do it in an aggressive manner. So that's what he wanted, you know, to spread. That's ideology. That's the ideology he, you know, uh, favored. Mahatma Gandhi led a more subtle ideology. So that clash 
diverged them. But that very clash gave the Indians two new views to choose from or two new views to accommodate together. Trust me, there's a time till, we, till which we can bear things, tolerate things. Chori Chora was an example of this. A movement which was organized saying it's going to be a non-violent movement, violence broke out because we were done with whatever is happening in the past century. Okay? So we were done with it and we reacted as anybody would have reacted. Okay? Um, right or wrong, it's up to you. It's my perspective. Okay? And I'm sure I'm free to offer perspectives. So you all can think for yourselves according to you. What do you think was the right? And all of us vary in our ideologies. Well, I am not a very huge supporter of Mahatma Gandhi. Though for me, what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. So he did right things, I'll say he did right things. What he did wrong, I'll say he did wrong. Okay? So, yeah, I mean, um, choose your ideology thinking about it. To, uh, you know, come up with, the, I won't say judge people. I would say make conclusions about people in such a manner that, you know, all facts are clear be before you. Um, all right. So that was Subhash Chandra Bose in front of you. Now coming to Congress Socialists. Please remember that um, you will come with a few names over here like Jay Prakash Narayan. You will come up um, with Atari Narendra Dev, Aruna Asif Ali, Achit Patwardhan, Ram Manohar Lohia. They all formed the Congress Socialist Party in the year 1934. 1934. They formed the Congress Socialist Party. And these leaders, they played a crucial role in shaping the socialist agenda within the Congress itself. Okay, these members, these were the members of Congress, but they, they aligned themselves with the Congress socialist ideologies. Okay, just like Jawaharlal Nehru said, these leaders also said that, you know, we should combine the struggle for political independence with a commitment to social and economic justice. Okay, so it was formally established in the year 1934 as a socialist group within the Congress. Okay, this group aimed to influence the policies of Congress and work towards a socialist and democratic India. You will see that this socialist group it played a prominent role in the Quit India movement of 1942, which was a mass protest against the British rule in India. They were very active in organizing and leading protests, advocating for an end to British colonialism. Okay, so they played a very important role when we talk about the freedom struggle in India, okay? Um, you will see um, Patavi Sita Ramaya, Sardar Patel, Rajendra Prasad, and there were other old leaders in the Congress. They were totally against these Congress socialists, okay? You'll see that Sita Ramaya even calls them, <coughs> come, okay? Um, You'll also see that Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, though Jawaharlal Nehru advocated the same thing, yet Jawaharlal Nehru was a very close friend of Mahatma Gandhi and Mahatma Gandhi was not a huge fan of them. So Jawaharlal Nehru also, yeah. So Jawaharlal Nehru also was against these Congress socialists. See, uh, the Congress socialists, they pushed for a more radical and socialist oriented policy rather than, you know, being moderate. Once again, the concept of moderate and extremist jumps in. Okay. So, um, yeah, again, you will see that there's a clash between the, between the party itself. Jawaharlal Nehru never spoke up. Okay. Uh, though he was in, inclined towards socialism, like I told you, oh, um, you know, a few slides back, he was sympathetic towards the group. He supported many of the views, but he was attached to Mahatma Gandhi as well. So that attachment did not let him to move towards the intellectual attachment towards uh, this thing, Congress socialist. 
later on you will see that uh, like i said subhash chandra bose he was expelled um, from the congress so when subhash chandra bose he was expelled from congress he formed um he formed a political party which i told you about the forward block with these leaders so the forward block was formed with these co uh, congress socialist okay see uh, subhash chandra bose he wanted this block as a platform of you know people who are like minded to come together okay focusing on the communist and social ideas but the congress socialists did not have that much courage to do it they were aligned with the national congress their main idea over there was that it's the national congress only which can lead us to the freedom struggle okay uh, they did not want to fight against the gandhi wing okay so this choice had been difficult for the left wing okay also subhash chandra bose previous record it had not been one which could inspire them okay he thought that they thought that he's unqualified enough to do it um so though they were facing differences they did not want to separate themselves from the national congress all right <coughs> so they kept on supporting the national congress also you move fast forward to the independence after independence congress socialists they continued to advocate for socialist principles okay they held positions in the government they contributed to political discussions okay but we see that later on congress socialist party was formed because of the continuous differences okay <coughs> uh so i think i have covered all these points up yeah the congress socialists they wanted to abolish capitalism zamindari and uh, what do you say capitalism zamindari and you know the concept of princely states but congress was not going to abolish it and you will see that even when the privy purse was brought by mrs gandhi privy purses act it did not go well with the princely states so the congress was not i mean this congress wanted to do this it wanted to do but this was a very huge risk so it did not actually go towards it communists they owed their allegiance to the communist international okay formed in russia okay so they owed their allegiance to it and the communist section of the congress they were not pretty happy about uh, this particular thing and that separation from congress itself okay now coming to the trade unions now please before i move ahead let me tell you the thing over here even in this time we had a class of zamindars you can call them jotedars also okay because they had gained a lot of prominence by now okay and we had a money lending class so a zamindar class a money lending class okay then british came up with the idea of industries and we had organized industries also okay we had a lot of industries in india among these industries and factories the workers were not paid as much as they should be minimum wages maximum work that is what british were doing with us now they have already destroyed our handicraft industry they had already destroyed the local industries that we came up with and then they are coming up with this idea of minimum wage maximum work which wasn't very acceptable to the people in the country as well okay you'll see bombay and calcutta we had textile jute and tea industry there was a lot of working class population over here at the same time they had the rule of no leave okay there was no leave rule you cannot take a leave there wasn't any security of job the owner could expel you any time they wanted to then came in story shashi pada banerji he formed the working men's club okay he organized the club for these union and factory workers okay he was a radical follower of brahmo samaj and he organized this then he pub published the journal also bharat shram jeevi shram jeevi is actually indian workers shramik okay um see he did not form any trade union per se okay uh later on you will see that nm lokhande he started the weekly din bandhu okay he also founded bombay middle hands association okay 
Once again, it wasn't a trade union in the modern sense of trade unions. So the first trade union, which you can actually call a trade union, was Madras Labour Union, 1918, by B.P. Vardia. B.P. Vardia was actually a very close associate of Annie Besant. Okay, uh, and then you will see that uh, Mahatma Gandhi also jumps in with the Satyagraha in 1918. Okay, uh, 1920 he formed the Majur Mahajan. Majur is once again Mazdoor, Majur Mahajan. Okay, peaceful relations between workers and their employees. So now that first trade union was formed, other trade unions had also started taking shape simultaneously. There were a lot of industrial strikes that took place in Kanpur, Calcutta, Jamshedpur, Ahmedabad, Bombay. Okay, a lot of workers participated. And it was now felt that we do need an all India organization, and that's when All India Trade Union Congress was formed. Okay, Lala Lajpat Rai he presided over the inaugural session, and then we had a lot of nationalists also jumping in, like Andrew C F Andrews, Annie Besant also came, and M Joshi, Modi Lal Nehru came. Okay. But you will still see the growth of the trade union was very slow, because they all were scared that they might be dismissed from the company also, okay? And there came the year nineteen twenty nine thirty, the Great Economic Depression, a depression which brought down the entire world, okay? There were a lot of countries that were closed down. The workers lost their job. There were a lot of ups and downs in the trade union that was uh, trade unions that were going on. And you will also see that there was a split uh, within the trade union as well. The moderates left the trade union, All India Trade Union Congress, okay, and they formed their own Indian Trade Union Federation. Communists also left it. They formed their Red Trade Union uh, um, Congress, okay. So eventually, the trade union itself was weakened. All India Trade Union Congress was weakened, and the concept of trade union could not go for much more. Yeah, beyond this, okay. Kisan Sabha movement formed in 1936 in Lucknow. This was a movement that came as a response response to the ad, uh, to the exploitative practices of money lenders or zamindars. Or you know the overall um, agrarian distress faced by peasants. Now I, as a peasant, am being traumatized by the zamindars. I am being traumatized by the you know money lenders. I'm traumatized by the British also. I'm you know I'm being uh, what do we say um, exploited by all of them. Okay, Kisan Sabha. It was led uh, you know prominently by um, Swami Sarajanan Saraswati. Okay, um, N. G. Ranga and others. Okay, they all played a very important role in mobilizing the peasants, so they could fight for their rights. Here, the primary objective was nothing: give us a better working condition. Please address the issues related to land tenure and revenue, and we need fair agricultural policies. It also was an objective to lessen the economic burdens of the you know farmers. They were facing a lot of burdens. If the crop failed, uh, you know, burden on farmer. They had to take loans again. That burden was coming on farmer. So they were not doubly but triply dominated, okay? Or maybe you know four times. So the Kisan Sabha it put forth these demands: reduce the land revenue, reduce the rent, okay? Abolish the zamindari system. Give us some land reform so that our farmers, the tenant farmers, feel security, okay? Please do something about the exploitation by many lenders, money lenders, and we need some agricultural cooperatives also to be formed. Okay, so that our issues are addressed time and again. We don't have to every time lead the movements like what we are doing right now. Okay, so these are the primary demand raised by the movement. The Kisan Sabha it actively participated in CDM also and Quit India movement also. Okay, because they thought the peasants thought that if it's the British who are ultimately suppressing us, so we need to fight the larger movements so that British could be expelled and that maybe our condition improves. Okay, and this movement gained impetus in various parts of India. Okay, especially where you had a lot of agriculture. Now, where will you find a lot of agriculture? You will find it in North India. Move to Bengal, you will find a lot of agriculture. The Deccan area. You can find agriculture. 
okay so all these places it was successful in highlighting the issues that were faced by peasants and now the peasants were also brought to the forefront peasants came industry workers came nationalist leaders came everybody was practically involved against the struggle for independence okay till here the situation was of movements movements being formed people joining the movement and what happened simultaneously we also talked about prominent ideologies spreading now what we are going to discuss is a prominent act introduced in india by the british please pay attention to this act the government of india act 1935 why it's not there in your i mean it's not explicitly mentioned under a separate heading but i have taken it under a separate heading so that the pointers are here clear now when we move ahead and i mention government of india act had done that you will automatically understand yes it had done that okay the government of india par act 1935 was brought by british first it decided to bifurcate the powers okay between the british government and the newly created provinces and princely states of india okay among a lot of opposition from the people in the nation they decided for the newly created you know provinces and to give them a greater autonomy a legislative powers but the central power of defense foreign affairs and other important subjects would be with british only so we cannot give you all the powers okay the act proposed the establishment of a federal structure you can call it diarchy you can call it bicameral legislature okay we had provinces and princely states at the lower level okay and you had the central government at the higher level but the federal structure was never um, you know achieved in the federal structure you would have got council of states that's the upper house upper house nowadays is called rajya sabha and you had a federal assembly lok sabha and the members were chosen not directly like lok sabha elections we have directly they were chosen indirectly okay please focus on this point because this is one thing that catalyzes this in india separate electorates were introduced so that people of different um you know religious communities can get representation and that to separate representation so separate electorates were introduced one for hindus one for muslims primarily for the two communities this led to the feeling of communalism among people we are different representatives different needs different requirements different you will see that from here the demand of this has a background the provinces they were to have a diarchal form of government there were separate responsibilities for elected indian ministers and the governor general okay there were certain reserved reserved subjects like defense finance law and order that the governor general would hold under themselves but the other things uh, it was given uh, the provinces were given more autonomy okay there were limited provisions for franchisee and electorate okay and there were different provisions for different provinces you had muslim sikhs anglo indians europeans separate electorates were formed for them we also had separate electorates for depressed classes the peasant day scheduled classes okay their seats were also reserved in legislature to ensure their representation the princely states were given two option join the federation or remain independent okay for all those who chose to join they act gave them a special relationship with the center and abolition of provincial autonomy now since the world war 2 had broken out in 1939 this led to the suspension of you know provincial autonomy okay uh, direct british control was reestablished during the war 
so initially 1935 it was said that provincial autonomy will be given to you you have all the autonomy but 1939 when the war broke out all of this was taken away and the control once again went hard absolute control went into the hands of british okay moving before we go ahead to communalism so the the government of india act though it was said it was introduced for political and administrative purposes it wasn't the idea the very idea of separate electorates was a huge pointer for communalism in india and then you know what's the logic of the act if you're suspending it when the war has broken out 1939 india had nothing to do with the war except you know soldiers over there we weren't actually fighting a war and yet we were suffering the aftermath of it okay provincial autonomy was taken away from us you say that now you know lucknow is enjoying autonomy you can take your own decisions suddenly world war 2 broke out you said no 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 lucknow you cannot take your own decisions now now it's my turn um i because the war has broken out and i can't oversee all your operations so you know i'm taking everything in my hand that everything is in my control and then after you know you already saw that it, they couldn't survive for seven more years and they were expelled from the country this was the gist of government of india act i'm going to talk about it in detail each time i touch upon another aspect but this was the gist of the government of india act of 1935 i hope this much is clear to all of you now we will keep the act in mind and we will move towards um communalism the aspects of communalism what happened in the events after 1939 the 40s the early 40s and you know how did we move towards 40 Seven. All right. So let's move ahead.